2005 Defensive Rookie of the Year. First team all defense. Three-time Pro Bowler. Bah, 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 boom! Mr. Lights Out. How you doing, man? I'm good, my man. How you doing? I'm doing phenomenal. I, uh, I finished on three-time Pro Bowler there because I just want to start on what is your current feelings about the Pro Bowl and the, way, the new format. You, you, know what's, you know what's funny is, um, is that I, I, I saw the writing on the wall when they moved it from Hawaii, mm. um, and Miami was decent. Right when they moved it to Miami, yep. but even then they started to play a little softer. They started going a little lighter. Yes, and I just I just saw it was coming, and after Miami, I was I just to me personally, I was like they should just cancel it. Agreed, it's just cancel. But it's hard to cancel it because like ten million people still watch the damn Pro Bowl. Well, it's yeah. I mean, because it's a week before the Super Bowl, we're right. itching, right? Like, I mean, it's the only thing that's on TV. It's prominent, but. You had the experience, uh, three of them, man. So out in Hawaii, what was that like? Like, you know. <laughs> well, you know what? My my first year, um, I think it was only uh, two, it was only two rookies when I got when I went down. It was uh, me and mm-hmm. the linebacker uh, from the Seattle Seahawks. Hmm. To uh, Tulua. Uh, God. To oh, it's one of the it's yeah, a poly guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. And so it was me and him. And he can go. He can play. And. Um, I've never been to Hawaii before. So basically what happens is they give you uh, four four coach and like two first class tickets. So you and another person, you get four coach tickets for your family. Okay. And so I end up flying like 10 of my family members down, you know, because it, no, none of us, we're from Prince George's County, Maryland, Washington, D.C. area, man. We, long flight. Man. Long, long, <laughs> long flight, flight. But we didn't, you know, growing up, we didn't, we couldn't for one afford even thinking about going to Hawaii. Right. And so I thought it was like my f- first opportunity to take everybody to experience something like that. Yeah. And it was a, it was the best time that I had, you know, outside of the practice is like, you go there, you're drinking Mai Tais by the pool. Oh, that's amazing. And it's a, it's the first time too you get an opportunity to uh, to see everybody away from the field, mm. you know, like and kind of mingle, right? Because dude, like you get that time before the game, after the game, and then you're off. That's it, you know. So to see like to see Peyton Manning down there, like drinking mm. by the pool, joking <laughs> around, like you know, just laying back, you, you don't get a chance to see that. And it, it was your first one, so like, were you? Like analyzing, let's go to your very first Pro Bowl because you you probably were like, yeah, I'm come down here. It's serious. I got all the freaking top dogs here. Well, you you know, uh, <laughs> so outside of us, uh, uh, all of us having fun, it was it was a great time. Practices an hour. You're kind of jogging around in, in jerseys, and it's it's nice. nothing, right? Then you go by the pool, and so one thing that I learned as a rookie being down there is that you never call out your room number out loud. Oh, so shit, I know where this you, is going. Yeah, you never you never call out your hotel room number out loud, especially by the pool, because if they hear it, they'll charge shit to your room. Oh my god! And so uh, the waitress uh, was coming by. The waitress was coming by, and she said, "Oh, uh, Mr. Merriman, here, uh, what's your room number? You want to pay cash, card, or what's your room number?" And I said, "My room number." And then Ray Lewis kicked me under the table. Oh my god! So Ray kicked me out of the table because I was about to talk about my room number, my room in number front of everybody. in front of everybody, <laughs> and I'm at the you know we're at the table like 15 guys, and uh, he kicked me under the table, and I was like, what, what, you know, what's going on? So I learned that you don't, and somehow, some way, I still had like a, over a thousand dollars worth of room charges to oh my, my to my room. Oh my god! Um, but you know, I think the the coolest part about being down there because all the other celebrities going down there, so. I met Lil John. Lil John was hosting parties and stuff down there. In Lil John's prime, in, too. in his prime, yeah. Yes. And so this was like the key, like Crunk just came out, and I mean everything. It was when yeah. he was huge. He was massive. He's still big, but he's he was massive then. Definitely. And um, you know, I went out, and you know, I'm, I just I'm 21 years old, and so in my head, I'm like, dude, this Lil John. <laughs> and so we went out, and I and I met him, and we started taking shots. Mm. We start taking shots, and I'm like, you know, you you taking shots, little John, dude. Like, I, you know, I was first one. You're starstruck. Number two, you're like, I'm a part of the team. Right. Number three, you're like, where is this shit going? Yeah. <laughs> so, I got so damn lit. Um, I got so lit. I had probably about 15 shots, right? Oh my god. I got I got so I got so lit, and I saw Chuck Liddell. This is my first time meeting oh Chuck. Oh my god. What a 
So people, it was. Well, oh, it, what hotel is this out there? Uh, it was it, in Waikiki. I forgot the uh, uh, like some Milani or something like that hotel. Gotcha. Okay, um, in Waikiki, and I see Chuck Liddell. Now I'm 15 shots in. Somewhere in my stupid ass mind, I decided not only to shake his hand but like grab him to wrestle, bro, in the club. <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> and I completely. At this point, I'm gone. I'm all, I'm done. Right. Yeah. So I I start tussling around with him. He grabbed me back. And then the next thing I know that security, about six security guards, literally circled us up so we can wrestle in a club. Get the fuck out of I here, I swear bro. to God. Oh, my I swear. God. Ted, you get one, you ask, had, you had six poly guys that are just like, hey, brother, check this they, out. Nobody brother. stopped it. Because I think the security <laughs> probably looked at it like, okay, this dude big, that's Chuck Liddell. I'm not getting involved. <laughs> Very only true. Thing, only thing they can do at that point is just make sure everybody else is safe. Oh, my God. Right? So anyway, he he had a couple, and I had you know I was had fifteen shots or so, and <laughs> we both wrestled to the almost to the floor, but we fall back. We're laying on the ground laughing at this point. We're laughing, and so from that point on, man, he was like one of my one of my closest friends in in the world. Um, but unfortunately, the next day I missed practice. Oh my god! Probably first time in your career Ever. at that yeah. point. Yeah. Oh my yeah, god! Yeah, I missed practice. I I did. I got home. I got back to my hotel room, and I didn't. Uh, I didn't set the alarm. Mm. And so I got up, and I'm, you know, you got that oh shit moment, right? You look up, the sun's out, and you're looking at, it, and now it's like nine fifteen or nine thirty or something like that. Practice was set like they, eight. They, yeah, it was like eight o'clock or somewhere around. Yeah. There. Whatever time it was, they were coming back in. Oh no! <laughs> and so I'm looking at the players. I'm looking. I'm like, okay, cool. I had fun. I'm, they're gonna send my ass home. Yeah. But this was uh, this was a Friday night uh, that I missed, and so or Saturday. It was like a day before Saturday. The game. Yeah, yeah. It was a walk through. It was a walk through. Yeah. yeah, it was like so. Oh, you at were that, sweating. Bro. I was sweating bullets because I was like, you know what? It's a good time. My family's out. I'm just going. Hey, see you it. already had it, right? Already, the vacation's that's done. That's it. We're, yes. we're we're good. I had a good time. I go back in. I start packing my shit. I'm like. <laughs> They, they're sending me home. It's, it's, you know, it's just they're sending me home, and that's going to be the end of it. Uh, um, but luckily, it was so late they couldn't find a re- they wouldn't find a replacement anyway, so they didn't make a big deal about it. Um, but that was my ro- that was my rookie story. You, bro, you, you hear about these iconic? You hear about these dumb rookie stories? That, that was pretty dumb, right? That was you know, yeah. So I mean, but not too many rookies get to make it to the Pro Bowl, especially right. when it matters, bro. That's like me saying I graduated college before Chat GPT. Like yeah. it's just like I'm an edge up, right? You made it to the Pro Bowl when it was tough to get into and it was tough to play in. Oh yeah. And then you're down there, like it was my first time ever asking for an autograph. And uh I asked for Peyton Manning's autograph. He actually gave me his practice jersey. Um so I still have it. And you know, everybody signed these footballs and everything. So it was my first time even asking for autographs in my life mm-hmm. from anybody. Yeah, but it was it was one of those moments you can't you couldn't you couldn't pass up. You know what I'm saying? Like it was just it was too great of oh, a moment. And and that's a and that's a thing for me. I mean, one, it's like legacy building. Pro Bowls are easy to identify with how a person's career panned out, right? But then I, after seeing year in and year out all these players just choosing not to go, electing not to, I'm like, it's when that started happening. I was like, that's when it should have been. Let's stop doing this, bro. Yeah, and and, and then two. You know, at the time, see, now guys are making so much money, they don't care. They just don't want to get hurt, right? So, yep, and yep. so with us, if you, you get 20000 for going, and then you get 40000 for winning. And I don't know if you remember the the clip that Sean Taylor had when he with hit Brian punter? Mormon. Yes. And I, if you look at that clip, I'm about 20, 20 or 25 feet away. And when I tell you that hit sounded like a bomb going off, <laughs> it was so loud and after that, the whole momentum of of the game changed. Now it got now we got serious. Yeah. So that set the tone for just that game, or you think it, people looked at it like, oh damn, bro, the Pro Bowl isn't that serious? Well, you, you get out, you get out there, and everybody, you, you've been having my super duper my ties all week, and having fun with your family, eating every night, and you know, so everybody's taking it easy. And then when they get out there, nobody. Want to play super hard because you don't want to be the asshole. Yeah, like look at it, dude. Cal, I'm, remember Cal Vandenbosch, right? Yes, the defensive end from the Lions. He might have been the only person to play four quarters hard. Like he was just, <laughs> he was going so damn hard. And I was like, this dude's a machine. This guy's literally a damn machine. Yeah, and he was the only guy until that hit by Sean Taylor, and then every everything everybody changed. turned it on. Everything changed, bro. 
I think they should – maybe we do that to start off the new Pro Bowl, right? When we reformat this and we get them <clears> back in pads, it starts with Oklahoma drills. So we all know it's fucking serious, and then we go into the game after that. You know, the, the, the crazy thing is I think that if they upped the money, right? That's the only thing, right, that's going really if they, motivate if them. If they made the money bigger – because their guys are just not going to go out there and play for what's on the table now. They're making that, you know, in, in per quarter right. now. Right. So they're not going to go out and risk anything. But if they ever wanted, which I don't think the Pro Bowl would ever come back to that again because mm-hmm. the game has just changed in general. But if it did, they would have to up the money so guys go out there and feel like it's worth it. I, I 100% agree with you on that. Um, now, I want to I wanna take – your career, right? And I want to put it into a, a grand perspective, man. You were extremely dominant. Yeah. Um, from college all the way to the NFL. And you were riddled with injuries. Yeah. What is that feeling like after, you know, even at Maryland, you were battling through some stuff and then you go three years wrecking shop in the NFL. Mm-hmm. You're mental. Take me into that space. Well, you know, the, the hardest part with me, so I got my knee targeted in 2007 against Tennessee. That's what started. And mm. blew, I blew my knee out. Mm. Um, I was with Jeff Fisher. Jeff yeah? Fisher, yeah. And so, I, you know, I'm the tight man. I don't uh, I don't complain. Mm-hmm. I just don't. And when unfortunate things happen, you deal with it and then you move on. Mm-hmm. But from the knee injury, I came back and overcompensated for my Achilles. And my, I, I was fine from the knee action when I came back. It was my Achilles that I blew in 2009. Mm. Uh, 2009, 2010 season. And so after that, that's when I just could never recover becoming the same because I was so – in my size and speed, I was so explosive. Yeah. That was my game. And when that was taken away from me, it, it became like I was just a guy. And so I'll have flashes. I'll go out there. I'll get a sack or two. Mm-hmm. But I could never perf- – like the next game, I was just back to being a guy. Yeah. And so I couldn't perform week in and week out because my Achilles just – I lost the explosion off the line of scrimmage. What is that pain like? I mean, I've seen greats go down with yeah. this, and this is one of the toughest ones. I mean, with your size and explosive the way you're describing it, it's like DeMarcus Cousins went through a yeah. very similar injury. What is that feeling? Well, well. So when you tear your Achilles, you don't people don't understand how important an Achilles is until you tear it, mm-hmm. right? And when you tear it or you you pop your Achilles, this pop, mm-hmm. it sounds first of all like a tree branch breaking, snap like a snap, twig. and then you feel like someone kicked you. So I remember it was in Buffalo that I completely tore it. I popped it, you know, like 40 or 50%, but they still let me play. Same thing that Richard Sherman had when he when he had his deal. Got you. And so they didn't want to do surgery on it until I had a full, complete tear. Um, and then I was chasing Michael Vick when I was in Buffalo. Oh, that's a tough thing to do. Yeah. And so in my in my crazy-ass mind, I figured that I, I can catch Michael Vick. Oh, no, I got you. Yeah, Sean, yeah. You, you're going to do that. Yeah, yeah. I was going to run down Michael Vick and prove that I'm fast. And next thing I know is it, fuck. And bro. I was sitting, I was sitting down, and I was look, I was mad at my teammates. I was like, "Who in the hell kicked me?" That's that's what I thought. I thought somebody kicked me, so I'm looking around, and there's no one 15 yards near me. Wow. And that's when I knew. I said, "God damn it!" And so what happens is your foot just completely drops. You got nothing. You got nothing there that's well, holding your limp. foot up. It just yeah, limp. And so I came back after that. I got released by Buffalo, but they brought me back when I got fully healthy. Mm-hmm. But it was right after that season that I knew that I I wasn't. I've watched film. I, I couldn't burst. I couldn't turn it, a corner. Yeah, it was like that mental image of yourself, right? Yeah. All those years of performing exactly the way you expect. Right. And you're I, in your head at that time where you're like, "This is it. I'm giving it my all." Like, oh yeah, and it's, yeah. And so you know, it's funny about <laughs> about athletes uh, who play. You, you're almost the last one to know. That you can't play anymore. Like everybody else see it. <laughs> you know, everybody else see it. Yeah. But like you just mentally, mentally you can't accept the yeah. fact that you you're not the same player anymore. Because outside of you having the physical capabilities of doing all these things, the mental part makes you greater than a, a lot of people because you're able to take your mind to places that they can't. Mm-hmm. And so mentally, I, I was just like, I'm there, but my body was like, No, you're not. You can't do this shit anymore. And so it was after that season, I was like, you know what? I had I did my thing, and unless I had a real opportunity to go and win a Super Bowl somewhere, it's not even worth coming back and doing it. And that's when I got into doing broadcasting on TV. And before we shift into your broadcasting and, and what happened after your career, my brother, he plays at San Jose State. He's the starting left tackle there. 
And, you know, my dad had mentioned something to me uh, this past time when we went up to visit him. And it, and it struck a, a nerve with me because there is such a thing as post-sport depression. Mm -hmm. And you're constantly, every day, you're being reinforced. Good tackle, way to hustle. You get reinforcement from everybody. And then the day you don't go back to that facility, you lose all those positive yeah. inputs. What is your take on like what players should do after football ends so that they can stay mentally strong? I, I tell any guy, um, before you retire, be prepared to move on. Mm. Because that time, that downtime you have, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to take a year off or six months off, whatever. That's, that's your worst time. Because you 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 miss the locker room, you miss the camaraderie, you miss your your regimen, right? Yep. Um, and just the ability to go out and, and compete, you don't have that anymore. And so the, the hardest time, and mind you, I went straight into TV and broadcasting, mm -hmm. and it was some days I was even on set uh, where it's like, this is it. I just want to hit something. You just right want now. to hit somebody, and then you don't even feel comfortable talking in in the broadcasting side. You don't feel comfortable talking about other players because in the locker room, you, you don't. We don't do that. Right. Right. So you had to. You, you in a way, you almost had to transition your thought process. You're not a player anymore. You're an analyst. Yeah. And so I remember, um, I was at NFL Network, and one of my boys uh, played DB, and we were breaking down a film, and it was a cover three, and he blew it. Mm -hmm. It was on him. Mm -hmm. And I just could not bring myself to say that it was him who blew the coverage. You were like, great offensive play there. And you I was know. like, <laughs> and, you know, the rest of the guys who were on the panel, they knew at the time who did it, and they didn't understand why. And they, they'd been retired for 10-plus years already. Yeah. But they could not understand why I couldn't say, hey, my guy, my boy, blew this cover three. You know, he's supposed yeah. to have the help over, you know, so he, he messed that up, and I could not bring myself to say it. So it's interesting because I would imagine there was journalists and sports reporters all throughout your career that you probably didn't like. And then you're like, I'm going to be a journalist afterwards. And what is that take? Did you always like reporters in journalism? Or? Yeah, I know. You know, even when I got reported on bad or somebody, when I, especially when I came back and I wasn't healthy anymore, I wasn't playing. Like I, it was a bunch of that, a bunch of negativity. Right. Everybody got jobs, man. Like, so if you, I always looked at. I never, I never looked at like, oh, that guy don't like me, right? Or this, He's, this publication don't like me, right? I was just like, man, it, he got. That's how he feeds his family. Mm -hmm. And so now you're not gonna go and be buddy buddy with him and and try to you know give him all the inside scoop and be friends. Definitely not. But you know, at the same time, um, you like, man, that, that guy got a family, or that that woman, she has a family, and. This is her job to to report on this stuff, especially the beat writers who's in the locker room because they see everything every day. Yeah. Right. So they might come out and see me in the training room or not practicing or see me on the sideline or in the pool doing pool workouts and I'm not at practice. Yeah. They report on everything. So I never took offense to anybody that did that because they got a job to do and their job is to sell their publication or mm -hmm. whatever publication that may be. And then you were like. I got some electric takes here, and right. it took you a while to open up. But how how do you like you know media and so? Well, let's talk social media. Yeah, and the this huge shift, right? Because it was network television, and now we are in a studio in Las Vegas, Nevada, and you're sitting across from a person you barely know. It it shifted because of the social media age. So, what are your thoughts on social media and journalism? You know, it's uh. So the crazy part is the social media would just kind of come around as on my way out. It was mm -hmm. getting popular. And mm -hmm. they had Twitter, I think, in 08 or 09, something that came out. But nobody really used it. And, in fact, we used to have a rule. There used to be a rule that we couldn't tweet like an hour or two after a meeting. Okay. We couldn't tweet an hour or two before or after the game. It was like rules with social media. In your contracts? Oh, yeah. Or, well, or like, like a, team rule? Like it was like team, team rules. Okay. Yeah, that they didn't want you to, like posting stuff around certain time periods. And so when you did that, you actually, we had guys getting fines for posting at certain times. Wow. And then you kind of fast forward Antonio Brown, like going live. And, Bro, in the locker room. In the locker room, <laughs> you know, so obviously, you know, the times have, have changed when it comes to that. But yeah. um, I, I think this, I think this social media kind of just changed the game because 
now, and first of all, I, I was always super fan oriented. Even when I went to other people's stadium and they booed the hell out of me, I got a sack or a big hit and they booed me and I'm talking shit back and forth with fans. Like, I always loved that. Yeah. You know, coming in there, you being a super villain, and there's like nothing they can do about it. They got to take whatever you're going to give them that day. Like, damn, Sean's kicking her ass right, right now. And man. so it's like, you know, it was, it was fun for me, but. Social media gave fans the direct access to talk to you directly mm. and say whatever they want to you. The little DMs. Yeah, those DMs. I mean, they but they'll post it right on the right publicly. Yeah, true, true. Um and I think that I, I believe it or not, I believe that benefited the game. Because now the whole thing with fans, even when they come to the games and they talk shit, mm-hmm. they talk shit because they spent that hundred and something dollars for a ticket or two hundred bucks, whatever the ticket price was. Yep. You know, they're paying, you know, another eighty to a hundred dollars for concession, whatever. They're paying another fifty or sixty bucks for parking, whatever that number is. And so they're like, okay, I paid my money. I'm coming to talk shit because I can do what I want. Yep. And so social media kind of opened the floodgates for fans of your own team. Yep. And people who absolutely hated you from other other teams to talk directly to you. Public forum. Right? Oh yeah. 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 And they're letting it loose. Now you you bring up a very interesting point here as far as fans talking shit to players. Are NBA players way softer than NFL players? Because I've seen a lot in the in the past couple of years, and I never condone like fans going over the line with what they're saying to players, but it almost feels like the players now have the entitlement to say, Nope, he was talking shit, get him out of here. Yeah. Did you ever feel like you had that power? Like, or no. okay, no. And, and in fact, I think that um, you know the NBA players they have way too much pull when it comes to that. Agreed. Um, and, and and don't get me wrong, they it's racist stuff and and that that's not should be not be tolerated. And they they're doing that in an official catch that they should be kicked out. Correct. But if you're sitting there, somebody's heckling you for four quarters. That's what they're supposed to do. That's a home field advantage. That's that's what they that's the advantage you have as a home team player. Yeah. And um so I, I think that the NBA NBA has gotten a little out of hand with that. And you know, like I'm the biggest like I everything about Russell Westbrook I love. Yeah. The, his play, and I don't care I don't care how anybody what they talk about his actual game. This dude's a hall, he's a first ballot. Dude. Stud. He's a first ballot hall, hall of Famer. Of course. And anybody at this point to say that, you know, he's not is crazy. The only thing I don't like about Russell Wils, uh Russell Westbrook, Westbrook is, you know, that part of it. It's that he went into the the lock remember he went into oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. against the yeah. Suns in the back and because it, what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, ultimately as a player, it's not much you can do. You can get in the guy's face, you can say something back to him, but ultimately you can't do anything. They yeah. know that. Yeah. It's the reason why they're talking, because if they know there was no rules oh, or penalty God. for it, they're they stupid. would never Correct. They would never, because that's like saying uh, you you wouldn't say those same things to a guy on the street because you know there's repercussions. A hundred percent. But you can, you'll say that to somebody, a player that you know that can't do anything about it. And so I don't I don't like that dynamic of it. But if you know the guys are doing it and they're baiting you to do it, yeah. What's the point? Yeah. And I think that's the the I I say it's soft, but I just think maybe a little mentally more. Uh, unadaptable right like you have to be so mentally tough like bro it, i would imagine right you have tens of thousands eighty thousand people watching you they're all screaming it kind of all just becomes a white noise yeah and it's tough to pinpoint exactly where it's coming from um what was the worst fan base that uh you know you had to go play in front of the raiders yep. yeah uh, yeah the Let, black listen, hole they, was crazy you know, and, and the, the thing is, I, re- I actually respect them for it. Okay. Because they were next. They, the Raiders fans are next level with yes. it. Yes. And they're ne- they were next level with us because there was so much hate between the Chargers and Raiders fan base. Still is. Yeah. Still is. I just went to the last uh, one at Allegiant. I do think it's way different it's now. It's way the different. The Coliseum. Oh. Bro, in Dude, the we, dirt. We, oh. we, used to, we used to get there, and they would throw stuff at our bus on the way in. They would Classic. block. They would block us. Some of them would block us from pulling into the places we need to pull into. You know, when you get there, you're warming up around the field before the game. They they're liable to say anything to you. In fact, my my rookie year, I remember hitting uh, uh, the quarterback. I think it was Curry Collins at the, okay. at the time or something like that. Um, and I hit him, and I remember getting to the sideline, and 
my helmet just rang. Boom. And somebody threw a, like one of those uh, square bu- batteries. No fucking way. They threw one of those square batteries. My uncle's told me about this. He's a Raider fan. And he's yeah. like, he he's seen shit like that where he's like, they're throwing fucking D batteries, G. Oh, yeah. They threw, they threw it. It hit you. It hit me right in the helmet. <laughs> oh, my God. It hit me right in the I helmet. I can't wait to send him this. And so <laughs> that's when I that's when I knew I was like, yeah, this is a different place. Cause that wow. you, you may get some of that in Philly, maybe. Yeah. yeah I remember playing in my, my rookie year as well. Mm-hmm. Um you may get some of that in Philly, but it was just so much hate between the two fan bases. And, you know, having, you know, Marty Schottenheimer there didn't help because he, he, Raider Week was, I mean, you might, we might as well have been playing in the game because some, some days we're going tackle to the ground. We would have live goal line during the week. This is not training camp. During the week, wow. we would have live goal line during Raider Week because that, that whole week was just. It's different. It's different. Now, Wow, that brings up a great segue. Marty Schottenheimer. In your eyes, what was happening there? He goes from having the best record in the NFL to getting fired. Yeah. Did you sense the turmoil that season, or was that all behind closed doors, the GM and him just didn't see eye No, eye? everybody knew it. Yeah? Every, everybody knew it. Really? Because you, you – you had A.J. Smith, who was the general manager there at the time, and then you had Marty Schottenheimer, which is two very strong personalities. Mm. Very, 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 very strong personalities. And yeah, I remember them almost getting into a fist fight. No shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, and then normally, you know, because I'm in the fight business now, normally I encourage that shit. You know, I'm like, yeah. hey, I hit him, you know. <laughs> um, but it was, it, was one of, it was one of these things where it was so known that they didn't like each other. And people were so surprised after getting fired after fourteen and two season, because normally that never happens. Yeah, that just doesn't, doesn't. It didn't happen. But it was it was so much friction there that I don't see that happen. They couldn't have they couldn't have played together another season. Got it. They couldn't have. Got it. Um, the and that's when North came in. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think? Well, from what I understand, Norv is kind of like polar opposite of yeah. Schottenheimer. Was Shotty more? He's more of an offensive minded yeah, guy. Yeah, Norv is. Yeah. Was uh, Schottenheimer? De- uh, no, he was defense. He was defense. And it, it, this, how, okay. this is how the dynamics changed. And so when Marty was the coach and the defense kicked the offense's ass, we had a great day. Right? Yep, yep, yep. When the offense kicked our ass. It was hell. It was, it was hell. Started over. Yeah. It was one of those started over days. <laughs> and North came in and it was reversed. Yep. Right? North came in, it was like offense, great day, defense, terrible. Yep. And so it was. It was a little bit of a, a a shift, in you know the coaching styles when they came in. But but Norv, man, like people even still now to today, I know he won't get the credit as a head coach, but I played for uh, Ralph Friesen in, in college, mm. who also was a coach at one point with the Chargers, a long long time ago, in like the early nineties or something like that. Okay, um, they're two of the greatest offensive minds in history of the game. And when I tell you that, man, they they looked at everything completely different, um, and they did this crazy, crazy shaking motion. They both, and that's only two people I've ever seen do it. When the ball is snapped, Norv and Ralph F- Coach Friesen would stand behind the offensive play, and when the snap, their head do this. No fucking way. It's, it was the craziest thing to see. Craziest thing. The way to you see. just did that, though, though, makes perfect sense. They're trying to analyze they, ex- everybody's first move on defense. They analyzed this wide receiver all the way to that wide receiver and looked at every offensive lineman, every quarterback, and every running back, every tight end, in the blink of an eye. Wow. And at first, you know, when when Norv, I, I seen it in college because Ralph, you, yeah, 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 yeah. Friesen would do it, and I just like okay, maybe he has a something. Right, right, right. right. He's a little... And you know, we all, all, all knew he was a offensive minded like genius. Um, but then I seen it out of North, and I was like, "Oh, I, I seen this. I seen I've this. I've seen before. this little puzzle before, yeah. man. Man. Okay. So I've always been under the impression. Hopefully, you can clear this up with me. They, for example, the Houston Texans this year, they get D'Amico Ryan's as their head coach. And they're bringing in a rookie stud quarterback, C.J. Stroud. I've always been under the impression that, all right, defensive-minded head coach, rookie quarterback, doesn't really mix, right? Like, that defensive-minded guy doesn't know how to foster that quarterback and that young mind. Is it as 
serious is that? Like, would you see Schottenheimer spending way more time with the defense and leaving offense to kind of do their thing? Do you think D'Amico would do the same thing and kind of hope he figures it out? No, and, and this is why I think that dynamic is going to work okay. for them. I think it's going to work because D'Amico, he's one of the smartest play, defensive players, mm-hmm. you know, this this play the game. Um, but he, he has that youth. He's young. Um, and I think that he's going to be able to relate. It's very important lately. It's, it's, it's so important because yep. – it's it's changed the dynamic. This and this is why I can't coach. I, I couldn't. I just couldn't coach. I'll go out there and I'll coach high school. I'll coach kids all the time. I'll work with pass rushers, and I'll individually help guys all mm-hmm. the time. Even this off season, I'll, I'll be you know maybe go to the Chargers training camp, work with the young guys. I work position based, but I can never be a coach because the dynamic of what a coach is now has changed. Yeah. You know the dynamic now is you have to relate to guys. And you have to have an understanding and, like, get along with them instead of being a coach. Because some of my best coaches, we we didn't get along. Me and Ralph Fries in the college, we didn't get along early on. Really? We didn't because, you know, just the authority figure and think, like, we eventually did, but we didn't initially. Got you. And so you, when I, I have this, this thing that I'm the coach and you the player, right, and I'm not going to be your friend. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to be cool with you. Right. I'm not getting trying to get you to understand where I'm coming from. This is the play, right? And and I want you to run this play because I've I've done it already before. Yes. I've done this. Yep. Um, but what I do, and this, this is something I learned from Wade Phillips, which is the, the best oh, defensive coordinator in, in, in all, of all time, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, I, I really do believe that Wade Phillips is the best defensive coordinator of all time. And this is why. Wade was great at letting guys do what they are great at doing. I've heard this with another coach. He Bill he f- he figured it out where you got these you got some coaches like this is the play this is the playbook and we're not doing anything outside of that. Even if you suck at it, you're gonna do what I tell you. Gotcha. Right? Because this is what this is what I this is what we're doing. Yep. Um, but if you can rush the passer, great. You're rushing the passer. If you suck at dropping and covering, you're not you're gonna do. It's gonna be eighty twenty rule. Yep. And, you know, we got guys that were great pass rushers, couldn't drop, or vice versa, could, could drop, but just suck at pass rush. Mm-hmm. So you were, you were doing most of the time, 80% of the time, what you're great at. Even if that wasn't his philosophy, he's going to put you in a position to win. Yeah. And not do, put you in a position to do what he wants you to do. And that's definitely a, a, a recipe for winning there. I, I've always found that to be so entertaining when you see new coaches come in and they, they say, like, they're bringing their system, and it's like obviously you can bring in a system, but if the roster don't fit, then we're just fitting a whole bunch of wrong puzzle pieces into the puzzle. If you if you got a guy that's a if you got a guy that's a generational talent, right? Mm-hmm. Um, a Khalil Mack, a Nick Bosa, or mm-hmm. you know, you know, a Demarcus Ware, a uh, Von Miller, you don't come in and say, "Hey, this is my playbook." Like, okay, what what are you great at doing? Yeah. Okay, this is our system. This is what we need you to do on certain plays. You got to be in this gap. You got to take on a guy with this shoulder or what, wherever you got to do. You got to drop in this area. You got your plays. But we had a rule, and for us, even with me, it was like, hey, if you're going to do this, you better make the play. So they, they, I had a free range to do certain things sometimes, whether go up under, wrong on, yeah, wrong yeah. on, come around. I can do what I want as long as I was making the play. Damn, that's pretty – that's fun though. It almost it's almost like uh, with these tight ends and the option routes and stuff that right. you know they get the opportunity to to showcase some of those skills. But wow, that uh that definitely I would imagine helped you play way more freely. Like you, <laughs> we, well, I came to camp late uh, my rookie year, and what I, was it? I, I didn't show up to two weeks before the first like preseason game. I didn't work out with the team. I didn't do anything. It was a contract injury clause. Gotcha. That we had. Gotcha. Um, and so I came there late, and <laughs> I could not pick up the playbook fast enough. And, you know, I played strong side and weak side, depending on where they needed me, mm-hmm. right? And so finally, after like the fourth or fifth day of practice, or six, you know, I was like two weeks in, and I would just – they had to line me up. Our middle linebacker, Stephen Cooper, had they had to line me up all the time and get on this side. When they call your name, do this. And, you know, really trying to make it as simple as, as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so finally, the coaches, you know, Wade, Wade Phillips, uh, Greg Manunsky, who was a defense, he was our linebackers coach, and then John Pagano was our 
linebacker. It was no, we had a, we wow, had a, that's a we had a great group, man. And so they finally brought me into the room, and Wade Phillips looked at me. He said, "Sean, you know what I want you to do? I want you to see ball, go ball." Oh no way! Now, this this is my playbook <laughs> for weeks. They said. We'll get you lined up. The our our inside linebacker, they'll Donnie, it was Donnie Edwards at the time. Okay. Uh and Randall Goffrey. They said when they'll tell you where to line up, and when they call your name, position, you rush. When they don't call it, you drop. That was it. The first half of the season. Wow. I swear that first because I could not pick up I didn't put it pick up Just, the playbook to like game four or five. Do you think that's the easiest transition you can give some of these rookies? Because it's already stressful enough. You're playing at that higher level of speed, right? And you know the playbook definitely gets a couple of hundred pages thicker. Yeah. Oh no. It, it was. I mean, dude, it was so hard for me to pick up the playbook because it, I was playing a different position, right? Mm-hmm. Than I was than I was accustomed to. Yeah. Um, and in the, in the NFL, they want playmakers, right? It's not yeah. a, if you can go make the play, you got the free range to do a lot. Right. And it was, they literally sat me down. They said, hey, see ball, go ball. I said, what do you mean? He said, okay, we call your name. We do not call your name. We call your name, go get the ball. Wow. And so, you know, one thing I could do, and, and the easiest, I think, the easiest thing to do when you get in the NFL is to rush the passer because that's a natural talent. Right. A, a phys- physicality. Yep. Right. Ability. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's one thing I could do, but I could not do a lot of stuff, right? If they came over and they ran a reverse or they ran. You know, a, 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 you know, anything in the flats or anything like that, yep. I was just like, what do I do? Yep. Where the guy's running right past my face, and then you hear me, oh, shit, right? <laughs> 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 you can't, oh, fuck, it's yeah. sweet. <laughs> so you're sitting there on the end of the line of scrimmage not knowing what to do, and you see this guy flash across your face, and you know that you're man. Oh, shit. <laughs> and you guys hear me. So that happened a few times, and after a while, they just said, um, they said, man, see ball, go ball. And when we don't call your name, and it's a cover four, cover six, cover two, whatever, you're dropping to the flats or you're or, or in the seams. Yeah. That was it. And so when I really got the playbook down around a fourth or fifth game, then I could switch sides, right? Play the yep. wheel, play the you know, move me inside. I can, you know, whatever. Yep. I can, you know, do stuff. But for the first four games, you'll see ball, go ball. So I feel every time that, or like when you were telling that story there, it just reminds me of Micah Parsons this last year. Yeah. And I'm like, I wonder if Micah Parsons had the C ball, go ball type of playbook. What do you think about him? Um, people are saying that, like, especially with his performance last season, that he could be one of the greatest edge rushers if he can keep up this pace. I, you know, I watched him uh, because LeVar Arrington was a mentor of mine when I was in college, okay, in high school. Um, and LeVar took me under his wing when I was in high school because I got his younger brother to play basketball with me in high school. Oh, nice. So uh, he was telling me about Micah Parsons, you know, when he was in college because he he got – I think he got him to wear number 11. Yeah, when yeah he was Penn in, State. In Penn State. And uh, he said, he said, Sean, watch out. For, as a freshman, he was telling me. And I was watching him. I said, dude, this dude is ridiculous. And so I, I wasn't surprised of what he did in the NFL, but – He's he's such a freak athlete. You know, Michael Parsons is such a freak athlete that when you watch film of him, he it looks like everybody else is in slow motion. He's Thank just, I was I was just about to say that, dude. I watched his highlights, then your highlights, and I'm like, oh my goodness, is this just the speed of the game changing? No, as a whole? it's just no. He's he's, he's just, just a different animal. He, he's a and you know I was walking around during the offseason around two seventy. I played around two sixty three. He's but he's about what two forty five ish. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, but he's strong as. Strong as hell, mm-hmm. and you you saw he, he humped one of the offensive linemen and threw him off. Yeah. You know, yep. got us over three hundred pounds, um, and so he has this crazy mixture of leverage, speed, and power that we haven't seen. And and I'll and I'll say this: you all like when I came in, I was huge for my you know running like that. I ran a four six zero and a four five nine or something like that in my pro day and at two seventy two. That's impressive, right? Then you got him. What he ran a four four something like that a four three something crazy yeah right and so you have these guys to come in about every ten to twelve years you're like you know back then it was Vaughn right when Vaughn came in being yep. able to bend the corner and do all these things and I'm on my way out right and yep yeah, that's and then when you got a Vaughn Miller run. come in you got these guys so and now you got a Michael Parsons and so now we're seeing a a, a a generational athlete we're seeing something turn here that we just 
we haven't seen in the last decade. Yeah, and I th- we touched on it a little bit earlier. It's just quarterbacks are getting faster. Yep. And you need to just have the fastest human beings on the field. And it doesn't really matter if it matches up size-wise. I mean, the run game was very prominent when you were playing in the NFL oh, as opposed to now. Like, you, I've... You mean go into that? Just the we, stylistic um, changes. Know, so we used to play Kansas City. We used to play the Chiefs twice a year, obviously being in mm-hmm. the division, and they would just run the ball forty times a game. Powers, oh my dives, God. and you know they're running it, and you're just preparing for either that fullback, which is like Tony Richardson, all these guys that just will just come. run right at you, or you'll get a pulling guard with Brian Waters and um, you know, uh, Big Willie. Ro- I mean, and they would just maul you. Yeah. They would just, you know, they would just maul you because it's like, what can you do? And so physically, you'll come out of that game and your shoulders and you, because they will cut block you sometimes. They will throw you to the ground. They will hit you in the back. I mean, it's violent, man. It's violent. And so they had Brian Waters, Willie Rofe. Uh, who, who's the other Hall of Famer? Um, they had another, they had another Hall of Famer there too. Oh my goodness! And I can't, I can't. Um, and then Priest Holmes, at running back, and then. He, Larry Johnson was backing him up. God damn. And then so and one player that people don't really don't talk about as much was uh Jason Dunn, the tight end. That was like 6'6, 280. Just straight block. And I, I he sw- was never going out for no, a round. I swear they kept him in that on that team in that division to block me, dude. I mean, <laughs> I was like, they was like, listen, we don't give a shit if you can't do nothing else. But, you just make sure that he don't get a sack. And this dude was so big, man, and he was so strong. That when he grabbed you, like felt like a damn kid. No shit. Yeah. Tight end, dude. Tight end. So, how do you think you would have fared in today's uh, NFL? Do you? Because I was telling Austin, I was like, with the way everything's positioned, if we're going to take your exact prototype, I would put you at D tackle. Or hand down in the dirt, D N. Yep. Right. Yep. yep. Um, and. You know, I can I can run and stuff like that, but they would probably try to, you know, get me off the field in a certain downs or something. You know, just mix it up. But at the same time, I could cover somebody out the out the backfield. Yeah, I'm not obviously running with a tight end or anything down the field because tight ends just, you know, they're different now. Yeah. Um, and they don't block, sometimes they flex them out. So I'm not yeah. they're not gonna put me one on one in coverage with a tight end who can run. But um, yeah, the game has just changed, man. It's just it's so different because you had to play the run. Like you had to play the run because they were just lining up in power formations and just gashing you. Yeah, you know, twenty something times a game. So let's go into you playing against Tom Brady and plenty other legendary quarterbacks, but just him in particular. Going into uh, those games, was it like I will pay anything in the world to sack this man? Because at that moment in time, he's on his run. Yeah. He he would is what I would imagine public enemy number one. If you're a pass rusher, you want to get your hands on Tom. So um, so Ray Lewis, I got close with him when I was in college. Uh, his younger brother Keon Lattimore played running back in Maryland. Okay, so I got really close with Ray, and he told me something that I'll you know I, it stuck with me for so long. And he said, if you want to be mentioned up there with the greats, you had to play great against the great quarterbacks. Mm. And so, you know, obviously you got Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, Ben Roethlisberger. And these are all guys at their peak, yep. right? Um, and so I knew that if I, if I had to – if I was going to have a big game against these guys, that's the only way that I'm going to separate myself as yep. a player from everyone else. Um, and I, I never forgot that. So if you go back and look, my, my rookie year, I think I got Peyton Manning three times in a game. Yep. It kind of re- what really put me on the map uh, in a, in a, was, a bit. Was it a Sunday night football it game? It was a Sunday night. It was a Sunday night game. Um, and I got paid Manning three times. That'll definitely do um, it. And so, yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, Big Ben was also at his peak. And I got Big Ben once or twice. Um, and I got Tom Brady. I got all the big guys. Yeah. And so, because you can have, you know, you can have two, a two or three sack game against the Raiders. You got to stat, you, you know. Yeah, Jamarcus Russell, we're not going to Oh, yeah. Talk yeah. About you know, uh, Aaron, Aaron Brooks, when you know, back, back when he was there. <laughs> They, uh, you know, you knew you were going to have two or three sacks those games, but I knew the ones that had to count is against the the great the great players. Man, that uh, that's such a great piece of advice. Ray Lewis has been a huge influence from you. I mean, he told you, hey, no no uh, hotel room numbers. Oh yeah, hey, make the sacks against the greats. 
Tell me about another little memory that you got with Ray. Like, how when when did you guys first meet? Um, when back when I was in college, okay. actually. And um, so so Ray, man, like we, we used to talk the night before every game. Really, and in, in the pros. And uh, I literally, you know, and you know how Ray is. Ray is intense, next level. So we'll we'll get out to team meeting rooms or about about to go on the team meetings or, or leave when we're done. And I'll get on the on the phone, with Ray, and I'm talking to Ray. And uh, Ray said, "Let me." He said, "Shay, what what we doing tomorrow?" I said, he, "This we don't play. We're not playing each other. He's you know he they're playing the Ravens playing whoever we're playing whoever." Yeah. And I said, "Man, we're going. I'm gonna do this, that, and you know, kind of lay it out. You know, I'm playing this guy. I'm gonna go under this guy. His inside moves is weak. Kick step is slow. Whatever the deal is, whatever." Yeah. And and um, Ray Blake, Shay, let me tell you something, Shay. I'm gonna run through somebody's soul tomorrow. And I was like, um, <laughs> I said, "All right, Ray, have a good night." And I had to get off. Because at that point, I want to get up and run through a wall. Of course, you know, I, I run through a wall, dude. Because he, he, uh, there, there's, I don't, I don't think there's been an, another inspirational, motivational guy that's ever touched the field than Ray Lewis. Yeah, um, and it wasn't just his play, but it was his, the ability to get everybody else great. And in fact, matter of fact, when I was in in high school, this is my first time. My high school coaches came out and said, uh, "Do you?" Want, I was went to Frederick Douglass High School in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. They said, "Do you want to? Do you want to see a great linebacker?" And at the time, I'm just starting to really get into football. You mm-hmm. know, like watching, knowing the, every, the players and right, right. everything. And this is like my my um, my freshman year in high school. And mind you, we didn't have anything. We didn't have anything growing up. So my coaches they scraped together a couple of bucks and they took me to a Ravens game. Wow! And this is uh, uh, freshman sophomore year, but this is uh, the 2000 Ravens. Oh, that's just the, yeah. the studs. Yeah, yeah. This is the yes. two thousand Ravens. So we get there to the game, and do we so we're so high up? You can just turn around and change the light bulb, right? <laughs> I mean, you could, you you can turn around. We're so our our seats is so cheap. You could turn around and just start turning turning light, light bulbs, bulb. and you're I'm, we're right there. And uh, this is this is when they you know uh, McCrary and Big Goose and yep. Sam Adams and you know uh, Jamal Lewis in the back. This is. They had everybody. Correct. And, you know, they're making the introduction to the team and the smoke and, and everything's coming out. And people are yelling out and they're going out. They had a long list of all these great players. Ed Reed. And all, I mean, just nonstop. Yep. The crowd is going crazy. And Ray came out last. And my coach tapped me and said, all right, here we go. And the, fi- uh, the fireworks came up and the smoke came up and then the Crowd just went quiet. Ray came out, and everything got quiet. And all you heard is, "It's getting hot." And then Ray, He's, so I used to joke. I used to laugh at people who used to pass out at concerts, right? The Michael Jackson. When I was a kid, I'm like, "Why would yeah, people?" Oh, like, oh, my yeah, God, I'm Michael. Like, I said, <laughs> I used to say all the time. I said, "Man, what?" He's just a person, right? He's he's just yeah. a, uh, he's a regular person like everybody else. Why are these people freaking out? Freaking out like that, and. I just remember the feeling of I was so excited, man. I had I thought I was gonna pass out. Right. Because I saw the I saw the crowd reaction mm-hmm. to one individual, mm-hmm. one person. And this wasn't a Michael Jackson concert. We wasn't at a Prince concert, no big famous Yeah, you know, A list celebrity. A list artist or nothing like that. This is a football player that made this all these people in here. Go crazy like that, including myself. I felt because we were so high up already. I felt I felt like I was going to fall over because I was getting Gosh. lightheaded. God damn! And I remember after the game, I I, I grabbed my coach and I, first of all I said thank you know because I've never seen an NFL game. It was my first NFL game ever. And I said one day I'm gonna come out last. And I'm gonna make people feel like that. And wow. that's what I did. And so my rookie year uh, when I with the Chargers and my rookie year. You know, we had a we had a guy uh, by the name of um, De, uh, De Quincy, I think it is, who was older guy, six or seven years in, and he was to break down the team all the time. He was the one coming out last. He would break down the team. So I told him one day, my rookie year, I said, I got this from now on. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm breaking down the team and I'm coming out last. Wow. And so I did that my entire career. Dude, that is fucking poetic justice. Yeah. yeah I'm sure you've told Ray that. Story. Oh, yeah, yeah. He knows. He knows. Yeah. And he, so it was, it's getting hot in here? Is that the? Yeah, it was a Nelly. It was like, 
Dude. Because, I, I mean, I've just seen the dance, but I didn't know, like, how the theatrics actually go in uh, the it stadium. Was, it was— But, um, like, quiet, quiet. It Because it, it paused, right, from everybody else being called out. Got you. And the smoke came out, and Ray just appeared from the smoke. Yep. And then the fireworks, poof, poof, and it's good. And he started, I said, oh, that's this it. This is dope, I dude. said, that's it, you know, and it was, um, you know, at that at that point in time, I just, I knew what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And did you wrestle in high school? Is that kind of like how this last uh, little evolution of what you got going on here with the Lights Out promotion? No, actually, uh, my coach, Marty, who was, who was the uh, wrestling coach at, at uh, Frederick Douglass High School, we still talk to this day. Really? And we, I regret not wrestling in high school. I would go in there and I would mess around sometime. And he would always say, you need to get your ass in Were here. you a hooper? Like, Did you hoop? Well, I played basketball, football. Okay. Yeah. All so right. I was, you know, all county, all state and all that stuff in basketball too. Um, but, you know, I was, you know, I grew up a rough kid in, in, in Maryland and Washington, D.C. So, you know, fighting was the thing. Yeah. You know. <laughs> You're and, like, no, no, no. I don't want to do this little gay man hugging. Yeah. All right. I want to yeah. fucking punch people. Right. And so it was. It was one of those things where, um, still to this day, we I still talked to the, the wrestling coach at my high school, and I regret that to this day that I never I never officially wrestled. What uh what weight class would you have been? 95? I mean, no, um, in high school, yeah. Um, I mean, my sophomore year is about 170 pounds. Really? Yeah. Okay, so you really didn't beef up until you got to my junior, Mar- my junior senior year. Got yeah, you. My junior year, I, I was like around 205 or 210. Gotcha. Um, but then when I got to Maryland, I, my freshman year I was two twenty five, and then I left there around two fifty five or so. All right, all right. And you were a Terp, and I've always wanted to to meet somebody who played at Maryland to kind of get this whole understanding of Scott Van Pelt and what he means to that DC community. And have you met him? Do you have any oh, memories? Oh yeah, yeah. Like, we got a great relationship, man. Scott Scott Van Pelt is. Um, He's he's like the like a like the voice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, like he, um, yeah. He if you if if you think about the history of Maryland and some of the 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 best, um, you know, broadcasters and radio guys and all this stuff. We had Johnny Holiday who was a legend there mm. in Maryland who did radio. Then Scott Van Pelt came out and just had ultra success in the broadcasting thing, but like never re- really let his roots go. Yeah. Like even now, you see him. We got the DC thing in the background, or Maryland dude. in the background. He just, you know, he's he's like he makes you proud to want to that you went yes. to Maryland. No, you know, I, one I of mean those things. It, it's one of those things. Whenever I've seen him, like just reporting on it, and then I like was looking, I was like, oh shit. Did you uh, like ever see him at like one of like a, a Maryland type dinner or something? Like, is oh he, yeah, like, yeah. A- we we you know we would um we would cross paths all the time. Basketball games. Sometimes I'll text him and, and different stuff, whatever. But um, we would go down to Tim Tebow's uh, event. We played golf together every year at Tim Tebow's event for like six or seven years straight. Um, and so one thing about Maryland, man, like we, we're, we're such a, a tight-knit mm-hmm. group that um, even I was in, I was in uh, New York uh, three weeks ago. I was going to see the, uh, the Yankees game, but the, the, the smoke and all the fires yeah, and stuff yeah. and it got canceled. Um, but I was sitting there eating. I was having I was having lunch, and two people next to me were like, "Go Terps!" Right? And I was like, looked over, and they said, "Oh, we went to Maryland back, you know, a little bit after you." And so we're 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 it's, us Terps, man. We're we're very very tight, all of us. So when you had to leave, and this will be my last question: when you had to leave the East Coast to play in San Diego, what a fucking culture shock that was! But at the best place you could have gone. It's not like you're going to the middle of America. You're going to the beaches. Right. So was it as bad as I think it is? I mean, you were 21 years old leaving East Coast roots. Um, like I said, God God always took care of me, man. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like God always took care of me because uh, I went, so I took a couple of visits before the draft. Um, I went to, to the Lions. God, you know, <laughs> Steve Mariucci was there. Um, Went to the Dallas Cowboys, the Redskins at the time, mm-hmm. and the Chargers. And you wanted the Redskins. So no, hell no. I didn't want to stay home. You wanted to get the fuck out. I want to get out. All right. You know, All I want right. to get Shit, out. I didn't know. Yeah, because you know, growing up there, going to school there, I'm like, it's time for me to go. Got it. Um, and the only two teams I wanted to actually play for was the Cowboys and the Chargers. Mm. Because I knew they had that back to back eleven and twelve pick. 
And so neither one of them thought that I was going to be there at that 11, 12 pick. They both told me, they said, we, we think you're going to go somewhere in the top seven. Yep. You know, um, but if you slip, we're going to draft you. We got you. And so I remember, and I've never been to the West Coast before, um, and I was flying in, and I'm flying in, and there's like palm trees and beaches. This is during a day, and I'm like, holy shit. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, please. Is I this a why? I was like, you know, you know, I, I've done a lot of charity. Like, I'm, I helped out a lot of people in my life. Come on, take care of your boy one time, right? And so... Um, <sighs> So I, I knew that if it wasn't going to be the Cowboys, it was going to be the Chargers, either one. Yep. And so it was a, it, it was a culture shock in a good way because the the lifestyle was different. Mm. Um, and I was away away from my family, away from people I grew up. So you kind of had to build your own. Right. Well, did was, you feel like that was like your now you're living a, your next life? Right. Oh, you had no, your no doubt. Yeah. Because you you got to think, man. You're turning. I was 20 years old when I got drafted, and I played in my rookie season. I think at 21. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you're you're be beginning to be an adult. You're paying bills for the first time, and you got taxes and all kind of shit, you know, for the first time. And like learning how to be an adult really was uh, was in San Diego. Wow, wow. That yeah. I mean, God did watch after you, bro. Yeah, that's You've what been I was doing like, man, a lot I'm of good. Like, in I got to do. I got to do some more charity work. You yeah, know? Like, I got to keep that going because he he definitely took care of me by by drafting me to to San Diego. And you uh, you've been helping out a lot of young fighters build that career. I think that is your yeah. next evolution of really making your mark on this world, dude, because to me, it surpassed, uh, the, I'm talking MMA in general, has surpassed hockey and baseball as the most popular. I think we got NFL, we got NBA, and then I think anything MMA is right there. Yeah. And you're helping build and mold that. Uh, What's uh, going on with the Lights Out promotion and yeah. what you guys got coming up? So we uh, we got a fight coming up. It'll be probably the second or third week of August. Excellent. Um, and Lights Out Extreme Fight. And so I launched that, man, honestly, because I was training myself and I had a passion for the, just the sport. And mm -hmm. actually, it, ex it it helped me a lot in my transition because I was still kind of – I was still competing. Mm. Um, I would go in and spar with some of the best fighters in the world, you know, and get a chance to learn and, and be around – so I felt like I was back in the locker room again. Yeah. So that was number one. I was like, this shit is cool. And I can, you know, punch somebody in the face and I can, you know, throw <laughs> right. around and like, you know, go out. Because when you're done with football, there's nothing else. Mm. Right. You go from whatever Pee Wee League or Boys and Girls Club you play for high school. You go to high school to college, you go to high school, uh, college to the pros. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else after. And so that built up like thing you have of being able to let out aggression or compete and yeah. to compete. Is gone, and so that's when a lot of guys struggle anyway. And I'm right. talking about mentally and emotionally, physically sometimes because a lot of guys let their body go because they just they don't have to work out anymore. They don't have someone telling them they need to work out at this time. Correct. Um, and so that for me was an easy transition, and what helped me also too on the business side of it is I understood TV, right? Mm -hmm. Being in a broadcasting booth, right? Um, I used to write and help create different shows and segments, and I was all into it, right? You're so a comedy I, guy. Um. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're pretty. Okay. Yeah. We. I'll keep you in mind if I ever start skit writing. I'll yeah. Be like, yeah. Hey, no. Hey, Sean. Oh, dude. And, and the funny part is that <laughs> when, when you're a big dude, it's, it's all it's already funny, right? Like you're bigger than everybody else. It's funny, so you don't have to really do much. Right. It's funny already, right? Because you're bigger <laughs> than everybody else. Um. But I think that you know that making that transition and just the ability to build lights out in general, the brand, because. Um, that was really my next phase into to building the company. Um, and, you know, having building a company with so many verticals, we, you know, we got tech involved and we're on Fubo TV, you know, mm -hmm. as a streaming platform. Um, and we have all these other like tokenized stuff and fan engagement tech and just crazy shit that's coming. That part of it is fun. The fights are going to be the fights. Like I, I can watch guys scrap all day long. Yep. And in fact, you know, it's, this is how I kind of knew I was going to get into the business because I would always, if somebody was about to fight or whatever, you know, you know, normal, even friends, yeah, normal people like, hey guys, you know, it's not the guys, come on, they're not time and place right. here, right? Now you're like, no, 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 you guys no, need to do I this. I was like, oh, fucking hit them. I was like, yo, you gonna let them? You gonna let them say that shit? You know, <laughs> <laughs> that was all, my, you know, my friends are telling me. So they, when they saw me make that transition to the the sport, yeah. In the business, they were like, oh, there's nobody else that that would fit better because it it'd be two of my best friends and. We uh we'll be leaving class or doing something. We had funny story, man. Dequell Jackson, who um uh, played at for Cleveland, 
You okay. Know, yeah. Play yeah. Cleveland for a long time. Play for Indy. Uh, so we're all really, really close friends. Me, him, and my other uh, uh, linebacker friend, who Will Kershaw, and we're leaving study hall one day, and uh, we're out in the middle of a parking lot, and they became playing around in slap boxing. And I think the quail had slapped Will's ear ring out, out of his ear. Oh shit! And he slapped his ear ring out, and so I'm in the parking lot, and Will picks up his ear ring off of the ground, and was like, "Dude, like, yo, what the?" And I said, wow, he, you, he gonna let him slap your ring out like that? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, nah, I'm, I'm yeah. gonna fucking hit this motherfucker. Right. And, and the quail, you know, the quail said something back to him like, dude, I'll, I'll kick your ass and I'll, whatever I'll else. punk you, right? I'll, yeah, right? Yeah. He's like, yeah, what you gonna do? I said, you gonna let him, he gonna slap your ring out and he gonna talk to you like this, right? So I'm, oh my God. I'm in a parking lot and I'm, I'm ready to see some scrapping, right? We all best friends. Yeah. Um, and so... That was that. That was me, dude. I right. wasn't breaking anything up. I was like, "Hey, you, y'all got to handle this because y- y- if you don't handle it now, then uh, yeah, man, you gonna he's gonna keep talking, right? Yeah. And, so, and I mean, I'm gonna be honest. He really did punk you. Like he smacked. Oh, the shit I wouldn't out let you, it right? go. And and finally, they they kind of caught on to. Uh, they finally caught on to me, kind of instigating the whole thing. Yeah. And it was like, even still to this day, we still talk about it. Like, you really tried to make us fight out in the parking lot. I said, I, I want to see some scrapping. You know, I want to see. I want to see you guys go. Uh, but you know, like I said, being I, I think um, f- for me being in this MMA space, we're having a NFL platform because that's where my you know audience and stuff come from. Definitely. Um, so I have the ability to give these up and coming fighters a new set of eyeballs that probably wouldn't look at them. Definitely. And so I started to see that that even if some people and there's a lot of there's a lot of MMA fans, as football fans, there are a lot, but there but there is some that's not. Right, they, can't, they don't like the sport. Yeah. So I, I even catch myself now and seeing some of the fans that maybe watched me when I played, right, or watched what I did, or whether they were fans or they hated my guts because they were, you know, Kansas City Raider Chiefs, fans. Raiders fans, <laughs> that they start to pay attention to these up and coming fighters, and so that is a part of it that I saw. Like, okay, I got to end. Mm-hmm. I got to end because I can provide something that's not being done in this industry, mm-hmm. um, and that's that's why we're growing the way we are. Yeah, no, man. I can't wait to see what else you got going on. I, I would imagine a lot of players, former NFL players, they're going to want that outlet. They still got that itch. So why not, you know, make that transition with you and Lights Out and, and get them? It's happening. Yeah. It's happening. We had, you know, it's funny. I had a, um, I had a couple of XFL guys who were, you know, kind of training lightly and whatever, but they were picking up their training during the off seasons. Um, and two guys were actually about to sign with me, to, uh, I think two or three weeks ago, and they got called up to the NFL. Wow. And so, you know, they called me and they was like, man, sorry, dude, you know, because they want to take a fight, you know, I think in October, November. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, bro, you got a chance to play in the NFL. Like, we're going to be here. Yeah. So, you know, that's go, dope, dude. I said, go, you know, go do your thing and um, just don't, you know, don't get hurt and just, you know, whenever that time is up and you're ready, we'll be here. Hit my line. Um, but we're starting to see, we're starting to see more ge- because it's money there. It is. It's, and like I say, it's the popularity. It's the, the money, popularity. It's the popularity. You got, t- you got TV now with all these big, you know, uh, streaming service, uh, you know, us being on Fubo. Oh, Fubo. Fubo. Um, and so you got, first of all, they can be seen and now they can get paid. And so I think with the combination of those two, it's going to have more people. Now, you won't get the bigger stars named, right? Guys that played 10, 15 years. You're going to get the guys who had a three- or four-year career, mm-hmm. um, didn't last as long as they wanted to, got chips on their shoulder because they pissed off now, then they didn't get their shot. Maybe a, Probably won a couple of state titles in wrestling. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah maybe, maybe, <laughs> a, maybe a coach. They feel that a coach screwed them over, organization. So I'm like, you pissed off? Okay, good. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, I need, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want – I want that, dude. Right? Sean, you're one of a kind, man. I really do appreciate you coming on and uh, giving me some of your time. Great insights there on the Pro Bowl, and I'm going to be like keeping my ear open around the pool now. Every time I go to an all inclusive, not all inclusive, but any little hotel, I'll be like, all right, two twenty eight. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> two twenty eight. Yeah, send it to my room. Man. Yep. All righty, Sean. You got it, man. Appreciate Thanks. it, brother.